This is Vitaly's interview with Guru Focus, special episode of the Intellectual Investor Podcast. Thanks for listening. Would you like to get the best articles by Vitaly from 2021 packaged with some art in a beautiful PDF? Head to contrarianedge.com slash almanac or follow the link in the show notes. Guru Focus Interview In this podcast interview with investment website Guru Focus, Vitaly shares the full gamut of how he invests, where, and why. He touches on the role of being eclectic when investing, how to invest abroad, and how value investors should think about macro, among many other important topics. Enjoy this fun and wide-ranging interview. All righty. Welcome in, everyone, to Value Investing Live. We are happy to be here to kick off the new year with Vitaly Katzen-Nelson. Vitaly has a CFA designation and is the CEO of IMA, a value investing firm in Denver. Today, we're going to run through some questions with him, uh, but please feel free to post those questions, as I do see some of you are already doing over there in YouTube. Uh, We will poke those in as we go through things, and we'll hit on all of them once we get to the end as well. Uh, As always, do please say hi. Let us know where you're viewing from. We love seeing those international audience out there joining us, and we're going to go ahead and jump into things now. Uh, So, Vitaly, let's go ahead, start off, uh, give us a little bit of background on yourself where you came from, who you are, give us kind of the the who, what, when, where, and so on. Well, as you can tell by my accent, I was born in Texas. (laughs) Um, No, I was born in Russia. I moved to the United States in 1991, uh, 30 years ago uh, in December. Um, And when we moved to Denver, like I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. I was 18 years old. It took me a few years to figure out that I love investing. And once that happened, it was like a love, you know, first sight. And I changed my major for the sixth and final time to uh, finance, got my undergraduate degree and graduate degree in finance, uh, got my CFA. And why, and I did this while I was working actually for this firm, IMA. So I've been with IMA since 1997, okay, believe it or not, well, you know, um, almost 25 years. And the, um, and uh, I also taught investing at the University of Colorado Denver for about six or seven years. Then I wrote two investment books. Uh, the latest one was the uh, the little book of sideways markets, which came out in 2010. And uh, I'm incredibly passionate about investing and value investing in general. So, uh, kind of as my as my partner, they may likes to say, stocks are us. I'm a stock geek, so I. Love to analyze companies, you know, and just let's say investing to uh, kind of over the years involved into a hobby in the sense that I would be doing it if I wasn't if I wasn't paid for it. So that's kind of my life story. Definitely, and so that kind of covers our. How did you get involved in it? Was there anything that inspired you right off the bat? Um, I guess what what sparked that interest to change your major for that final time and dive in. Well, I think investing is a very intellectually stimulating exercise where, like, there's this quote by Seneca that I really like, and it's kind of, I think about it all the time, time discovers truth. And if you think about it, right, it's a, you, you, you do all the research, you know, all the analysis, and then time will show you if you're right or wrong. Most of the time, sometimes there's randomness comes in, but overall, and so this is what I really like about it. It's just this constant intellectual puzzle. Also, if you're a generalist, this is one of those professions where I get to learn so much about so many different things. Uh, One day I may be analyzing a company that makes semiconductors. Another day I may be analyzing a company uh, that makes, I don't know, like submarines. And uh, so if you're an intellectually curious person, that is a perfect profession for you. And uh, so that's, you know, that's a kind of a perfect marriage for me as well. You know, just intellectual curious and it's, you know, and they invest in requires that too. So, yeah, definitely. And were there any, I guess, big name investors that initially caught your eye and that you kind of dove into to their line of work that helped you develop that interest? Um, I mean, <laughs> so, 
So as a value investor, it's impossible, obviously, not to be influenced by uh, Buffett and uh, Munger. Um, the, I think the Ben Graham's writing that kind of set the whole framework for value investing, I call it uh, the six, com- he created kind of the six commandments of value investing. And by the way, if your viewers are interested in this, we have a website called sixcommandments.com. And they can go there and just download uh, a chapter I wrote like on this topic. Uh, and that basically spells out the basics about the kind of the investment, pr- the principles, philosophical principles of value investing. Um, but over the years, it's just, I've been learning from a lot of uh, peers. Uh, and and so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can point out, say like, there is, and there's a lot of other, like there's a lot of investors for whom I borrow some parts of their framework. And um, I think the one thing that would makes us different from kind of from many other investors is that a lot of it, like a lot of investors are, they focus on a very specific niche, meaning some are deep value investors, some are kind of growth, you know, like, you know growth value investors. Um, I, we are very eclectic. Like I'll give you an example. On one side, we own a pipeline company, kind of an old boring pipeline company. On the other side, we own Uber. Okay. And both companies fit into kind of philosophical investment framework. Now, Uber would not be considered a traditional value company, but you know, the way we look at it, you know, it's a company that has a significant competitive advantage. Uh, it will be around in 10, 20 years from now. And it has, you know, and we are buying today a significant discount to its fair value. So, you know, uh, so for us, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, would, you would not call it traditional value stock, but it's a, if it's, you know, if it's significantly undervalued, that's why it's an upper portfolio. Definitely hear you there. So from here, let's dive in a little bit as you hit on there uh, to that investing philosophy. Is there anything specifically that, guides it obviously we're all here kind of under that overarching value idea but is there anything i guess any key tenets within there that you kind of latch on to rely upon in that day-to-day well let's talk about the six commandments of value investing right if i remember them all but just just think about it first of all you treat stocks not as pieces of paper but as businesses the second you do this you stop kind of you, you know you well, let's so that's that's number one. Let's we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, speculate in a second. You have a long-term time horizon. Um, the the risk for you is not a volatility, but a permanent loss of capital. Mister Market is there to serve you, and therefore not the other way around. Um, whenever you buy stocks, you know well, you look for margin of safety. If and there's I'm forgetting one or two more, but the if you follow these principles, it's impossible for you not to be an investor. I mean, uh, to become a speculator, right? It's an, it's impossible for you to treat market as just a gambling, a place where people come to come to gamble, which a lot of people do. So, though uh, you know, and that's how you become an investor. If you follow these principles, um, then you know, then you're basically will be acting as an, you know, as an investor. Yeah. Definitely. And from there, I guess, let's go to kind of a, a, a day to day, um, actually jumping in there, finding companies, finding these investments. What does that look like? Is, you know, kind of starting from the top at idea generation, all the way getting into, you know, managing the risk of a, a potential investment. What does that process actually look like for you? It's a lot less structured, a lot less busy than you think. Uh, we own some of companies for years and years. Oh, a lot of our companies, actually, for years and years. Um, well, the way my day looks, I get up early, early in the morning, about 5 o'clock, and I write for about two hours every single day. And that is my, I would call my superpower, in a sense that if I didn't write, I would not be able to focus. Like it's very difficult for me to focus for a long period of time, but writing makes me focus. 
And that's how I think through writing. So that's a, and then uh, yeah, I come to the office about eight o'clock and I'm here until four and then I go maybe four or five o'clock. Um, so how do we look for ideas? The ideas come to us from very different places. Um, you just have to be open that yeah, to receive them, I guess. So we, you know, we do screens. That's probably the least effective way of getting ideas, you know, especially in this market. I have a huge network of other value investors um, and I talk to them on a regular basis. And, we, and this is where we get ideas from all over the world. Um, I, we read a lot. Uh, and uh, so we have most of over the years created watch list of stocks we'd like to own at you know, different prices. So this is the source of ideas. And one thing important to understand that this is you have to expose yourself to randomness. In other words, you have to expose yourself that it's not like you're going to get this one idea a month. Sometimes you just, you know, like, you know, you, you just don't have any good ideas, you know, either no, you know, nothing comes to you or the market is expensive and there is nothing, you know, there's very little you know, that looks interesting. Um, and so when we find a company, we ask us a question, do we understand the business? And this is very important because if I can't understand the business, I can't be rational. Um, so if we can understand the business, if we can analyze it, then we move forward. And then if it, you know, then while we're doing this, if we discover that this is not really a high quality business, then we stop, we just move on and to something else. Um, and then we, you know, if we are still on this journey of the of any business company, uh, then we say, how much is it, you know, how much is it worth? If we can buy it at a discount to fair value, then may make it into our portfolio. If it's we find that this business we want to own, but it's not cheap enough, we put it on our wish list. Um, the way you control risk in this, basically, we control risk on the, on the security level by basically doing two things. You buy quality businesses, uh, and you, you want to make sure they're undervalued. Also, if you have a quality business that's growing earnings, then if you got the margin of safety a little bit wrong, in other words, if you overpaid for it a little bit, or you got, you know, you may get, you will get bailed out by earnings growth. Again, if you got the quality right. Um, so, and uh, on the portfolio basis, we basically, um, we don't approach diversification the same way uh, Noah was constructing his arc, and I'm quoting Buffett when he said that, where he tried to get two of each. Um, we just, what we're trying to do, we, Kind of, uh, Seth Klarman said, we worry macro, invest micro. In other words, we think about risks, headwinds and tailwinds, global headwinds and tailwinds. And then we try to kind of, not the short term, but the kind of climate changing events. And then we try to adjust portfolio to either benefit from them or to make sure we don't get hurt by them. And uh, that's kind of, and then uh, we, you know, and then we try to make sure that we don't have the whole portfolio, you know, whole, uh, all stocks exposed to one risk. So we want to, you know, this is how we look at diversification. We just want to make sure that not single, uh, a single event cannot, you know, kill our stocks. So. Gotcha, for sure. And thanks for that breakdown there. And you mentioned there. Uh, opening yourself up to a sense of randomness for ideas kind of coming in. Is there any, I guess, limitations to your investable universe or is there anything that you just absolutely wouldn't touch out there in the stock market? Well, we like stock companies were business. Uh, there, there would be uh, several that come to mind. Number one, businesses that we don't understand. Like I'll give an example. If it's a biopharmaceutical company with one early stage drug, you need to be a PhD and understand biology much better than we do. So that's that would be an example. You know, um, companies that are low quality companies, uh, uh, very deeply cyclical industries, we usually don't own. There are sometimes exceptions, and in, if there if there are exceptions, that truly exceptions where. You may have, like, I'll give an example. Like, we in the oil industry, like oil and gas industry, we would own a company that 
have royalty rights to you know, to, you know, to, to, to revenues of other companies. Well, that's actually high return you know, on capital business in not as such a you know, in a low return capital industry. Um, the also there are some countries where we just don't feel comfortable investing, and um, China obviously you know, comes to mind here. But also our rule is basically. If I, this is kind of a very simple rule. If I write an article, negative article about a company or about the country, and then I'm afraid travel into the country after that, probably should not own stocks in the company, in the country. So like, so like Russia, for instance, for me, would be out of bounds. So is China. And so uh, we basically stay in countries where there is a good rule of law. Gotcha. And from there, um, and I know there's uh, uh, plenty of questions you're rolling in kind of on this note as well. Uh, a lot of our audience, a lot of times, they like to pick your brain regarding uh, specific metrics and jumping into valuing a company. Are there any kind of key ones that you like to reply, like re that you like to kind of use on a day-to-day -day basis, or does that change over time? Okay. Let me try this analogy on you. Okay, and I, this is coming from a person who knows very little about carpentry. Okay, but let's say you're a carpenter, right? And you're probably going to use a different tool to make a table than to make, a, I don't know, a deck, right? So you have different sets of tools. So for, like when you analyze a bank, like say book value is a meaningful measure because the book is actually, you know, uh, bank's book value is calculated every quarter. If I analyze software company, book value is meaningless. So for every industry, the tool is going to be very different. And therefore, you just need to understand what matters for that industry, for that company. Um, and uh, so I, I hope I answered that question. But it's, it's, so there is... Uh, you know, if you know, if you analyze a software company, probably how much you pay per subscriber matters a lot. The bank, that's a different type of business. So it's a you know different analysis done. So definitely. So it sounds like there's not necessarily um, like one specific metric that you're applying on. It's more but, of a, a yeah. But I think one thing is universal, which is not a hard metric, but a soft metric, management. Like and I for me and as I as I as I, as I get older, I start to appreciate how important the management is. Like when you, are, when you are a young analyst, it's so much easier to learn by looking at the numbers because they're always there. You know, there's, there's plenty of numbers too. when you look at any company. You can talk about, oh, this company has returned equity of 26.2%. It's it's, it has grown earnings over the last 10 years. That's at 8.35%. And you, you know, all these numbers are just there for you, right? Especially in this computer age. Um, but what they don't show you, they don't show you the, tell you nothing about culture, they, they tell you nothing about incentives of the management, about the capital allocation record, about how well they run the business. And so one thing that's universal we're looking for in every company is that we want to make sure the management is good at, you know, first of all, I cannot tell you how much comfort I get when I uh, when I find a company uh, own a company where the management owns a good chunk of the stock. If the man if the CEO owns 20, 30 percent of the company and they say we want to make an acquisition, I don't even question it. Because it's a lot bigger exp you know, exposure to them than to me. For us, it's a five percent position. In the, you know, for them, it's a 30 percent of the net worth. Um, so but it really looking at the how well they allocate capital and how well they kept, you know, and how well they manage the business. Um, and if they, if there's a large insider ownership, that is just the music to my ears. So that would be something universal would be looking for. It's a kind of a softer side of analysis we'll be looking for in every company we analyze. Definitely. And that was actually going to be the, the next point we were going to hit on where it was jumping into managers. So you definitely covered it there. Is there any, I guess, inherent risk um, when bringing in the, that, the managers to the equation. I know I've heard past guests kind of argue against 
um, leaning into that kind of manager style valuation. Do you have any stance there of it offering a potential risk there for say a manager overselling a company? Question. Well, okay, so I'll give you a couple of things. So first of all, when you talk to management, you have to be very careful. And the reason for that is because you think about to become a CEO of a public company, you have to have a lot of different skills, but one of the skills, you have to be an incredible communicator, okay? So, you're, so when the management communicates, and especially, especially the management that figures out you're a value investor, let me send you the song that you're going to like, okay? And you find that the way they talk to you overwhelms your um, filters, and you, then you just basically just start buying whatever they're selling you. So I think I'm incredibly sensitive to that. So whenever I find that the manager is a very good speaker, I start my like it, I'm not I'm not gonna hold it against that person, but I'm gonna I'm gonna double down and triple down my analysis to make sure that it doesn't influence my analysis. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the danger of in general talking to the management, right? But, you know, uh, so I can you know, but you if, if you're aware of that, if you're mindful of that, then I think it's a, it's possible to overcome. Um, the I think the insider ownership I think is just. I, it's probably one of the most important things. You know, if, if you know, if if if, if CEO you know, management, if CEO owns 20, 30 percent of the company, I cannot tell you that you know, like I can, I would be so much more forgiving and so much more patient with that company, because it's just, it's a kind of, it's the reason that kind of socialism failed, because when you, when you when you like, uh, it's okay. So I'm gonna get off, off topic a little bit, but it's actually kind of an interesting point. In the 1920s or maybe early 30s, I forget when, in Russia, there was a huge uh, famine. Like the, and the reason for that, because the Soviets tried to, uh, you, so you, you had a village where every, there, was, there was a lot of farmers and everybody had the horse and the cows, etc. And then Soviets come and says, you know what? You don't own anything anymore. From now on, you take your cows. Your, you know, it doesn't matter how many houses you know, how many cows you own, how many horses you own. You give it to the collective, and everybody owns it. When every and and so what happened with basically the uh, the production of bread and all the other agricultural uh, products has declined tremendously. When that happened, because when when everybody owns it, it means nobody owns it. So when the management owns the company, like owns a good chunk of the company, they really do own it. When they own tiny, like when they own a tiny amount of shares, and they are kind of a full rent CEO, they'll be making decisions that will maximize their pay over that period of time while they're there. Even it means the company sinks, uh, you know, one, you know, once they're gone. So anyway, for sure. And now, I guess, since we've dive, we, we dove in deep, kind of getting in on what investing looks like for you, now let's pull back a little bit. Um, overall thoughts on the market, where we're at right now. Um, I won't ask you to do the, the ill-fated making predictions, but where are we sitting right now? What are you seeing out there? So it's kind of interesting. I just, I just wrote this article that literally came out an hour ago. And, I, and, the, and, uh, and the, ti the title of the article is, uh, I kid you not crazy market. Like actually it's, you know, and that is, and I go through several examples how overvalued things are. And like, and uh, I, viewers can read the article on contrarian edge.com. But uh, so let me just kind of give you high level, you know, what's, so, when you are when you're a child 
and you just learn how to count. And you, you know, you, uh, I'm sure you played this game as a kid where you give a number, you say 10, and somebody says, oh, I know a bigger number, 20. At some point, you get to trillions or bazillions. And then somebody says, infinity. And then another guy, kids comes in, he says, infinity times five. And then he thinks some more, he says, you know what? No, I got a bigger number, infinity times infinity. So the, and the reason I'm bringing this up, because when things get overvalued, you get into this kind of you know, territory, infinity times infinity, because it's very difficult to say, you know, like you lose the objectivity in measurement. So it's almost like, I'll give you one example. Uh, well, actually, let me say, let me give you, let me start, let me, you know, the way I started out this article, I talk about Coke. Coca-Cola, right? And it trades at 30 times earnings. This is a company that hasn't, like, it's a tremendous company. Um, it has grown, has not grown earnings and revenues much since 2010. Okay, but this is a company that's an iconic brand and it pays 2.6% dividend. In the environment where investors are starved for yield, they gravitate towards Coke because they're like, okay, that's 2.6% dividend. I don't have to question it. Company will raise it over time if there's inflation. And it's still better than, you know, 10-year treasury that yields, you know, less than 2%, right? The problem is with that thinking is that what happens if, when interest rates rise? When interest rates go from 2% to 5 and right now we look at this as a, almost like an impossible thing to happen. Guess what? The interest rates were higher before when we had a lot less debt. And I'm not saying it's a certainty, but I'm saying it's it's a high, you know, it's a high, it's probability that's not zero. And I would say it's a probably very high probability that, that the interest rates will go up, especially when a inflation is doing what it's doing today. And if in, if, if yields are if a treasury yield in five percent, then I promise you this, that Coke is unlikely going to be yielding 2.6%. Not because the dividend is going to decline. The dividend may actually increase over time. It's just the price to earnings multiple will, will decline. And, and, the, and, the, and the Coke will come back to where it used to trade in the past, maybe, I don't know, 12 to 15 or 16 times earnings. That means the stack will decline by half. So that's the least craziest of all. Then you go to Tesla, and I and I wrote the article about Tesla, and I wrote actually this like thirty page analysis of Tesla because I I think it's a phenomenal car. I own Tesla, and I think it's a phenomenal car. I absolutely love it. But when it had a valuation of a half a trillion dollars, I thought it was insanely priced. Now it's double, so it's I guess now it trades at double the insanity or double the infinity price. Um, today's Tesla valuation, basically, if you look at Tesla uh, market cap, which is somewhere between one and one point two or three trillion dollars, I, I forget where it is now, it's worth more than all other automakers combined. And Tesla is making a million cars a year. They make, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 million cars a year. I don't know how many, you know. So, and they, it's still worth, you know, market capitalization is greater than that altogether. So when you look at that, you say, you know, that's kind of, you know, kind of crazy. But, but then if you look at GameStop and AMC, you say, you realize, oh, okay, actually Tesla valuation not as crazy because at least Tesla is a company of the future. GameStop sells video games, packaged video games, and they've been disrupted by digital downloads, which we know next year will be more games downloaded and fewer games bought, you know, and packaged, you know, packaged than was, you know, this year. And so, and that's a company that has a $10 billion valuation. At its peak, it had a re re earnings of $400 million. Since then, uh, revenues got halved. So, so you think this company is, you know, has a crazy valuation, but then you look at AMC and it, it's even worse. Like it's, you know, it's a, you're paying 10, 10, 11 billion dollars for a company that has another $10 billion of debt. Um, it's, it's a share count went up four or five X. And its revenues, uh, I don't know, down 70, 80% from the highs. And this is a company that barely made any money. Like it made a money every other year or so. And the, and the apes, self-proclaimed apes, uh, you know, are basically pricing it today at $10 billion. So that's, kind of, that's even crazier than GameStop. Okay. But it gets crazier than that. So then, then we get into cryptos and NFTs, right? So let's talk about Bitcoin for a second. So 
it's impossible to price it. We don't know, like, you know, I have no idea what it's worth. However, I can tell you that in the environment where there is so much euphoria and a limited amount of optimism, its price is probably high, considering how much optimism there is out there. Um, but also, you have Bitcoin maximalists who say this is our Lord and Savior. That's the cryptocurrency. But then there are, I don't know, 10,000 other currencies who say, well, Bitcoin is kind of the stone age of crypto because technology is outdated and there's so many by, so many other alternatives. So now you have cryptocurrencies. So you have a whole bunch of other alternatives. Which one is going to survive? I have no idea. How much is the worth? I have no idea. Okay. And... But you think that's crazy. You could get crazier than that because now you have NFTs. And you could argue NFT as a technology may be an incredible technology. But the Ozzy Osbourne uh, from Black Sabbath now is uh, minting crypto bets and 9,600 of them. My son goes to see Boulder and he says all of his friends now spending hours and hours instead of being in class on the uh, discourse board boards. And here's the rule. If they show their love, how much they loved, you know, those bets, then they get to buy them at the wholesale price. So they can sell them at retail. And when they buy in, in, and long story short, if this, you know, they're buying digital, digital art, I'm not sure how, you know, if it's art or not, but just to flip it to another student, while, and they will be bragging how much money they made. If this is not a Ponzi scheme, I'm not sure what is. Okay. However, I can tap that. I forget the girl's name, uh, Stephanie, I think, Mato. She made $200,000 selling her farts in a jar. That is, and, and I would argue that the insanity is not that she was selling it, somebody was actually buying it. Two hundred thousand dollars worth, and then she had a medic, and then she I guess her diet was destroyed by, um, I guess it was you know she didn't have a good diet to keep doing that, so she had a med you know slight medical scare. So now she's back to selling NFTs instead. But my point is, what I just walk you through, kind of different levels of insanity, you know, and I think that's what kind of that's what the market is today. Okay, so that's kind of my. Kind of very my overview of the market. Uh, gotcha. Well, definitely some interesting thoughts there, and uh, things, uh, especially on the digital side, have obviously been uh, escalating over the last couple of months out there. Um, swinging back to actual investments, we've we've hit on Uber, we've hit on Coke. Are there any uh, strong investments uh, or things that you've won off of recently, or um, maybe things that have been brought in with a, a change of strategy here in the last couple of years that have been great successes that you'd like to highlight here? Yeah, so a um, couple of things. Uh, I'll discuss them because I wrote about them. Um, so we own pipelines. Like, uh, like one of the companies we own is Enterprise Products, which is one of the largest pipeline companies in the United States. and uh, What's interesting about pipeline industry uh, that over preceding seven years, there was a tremendous overinvestment in the industry. And there was so much capital destroyed that the industry kind of found religion. And now, if you look at the capital budgets going forward, they're minuscule. Okay. So, what, so if you think about what happened, so you had a lot of money invested and a lot of projects came online. So cash flows went up while capital expenditures are basically declining tremendously. So, and now they generate a lot of cash flows. These companies have pricing power because most of the contracts ha uh, have an inflation escalation clause, which only works one way. So that was if, you, if inflation, if CPI goes up, the pricing goes up. If CPI declines, it doesn't. So they... Enterprise kind of interesting because if I, I'm going to forget the numbers, but let's say they have five or six billion dollars of free cash flows, roughly, something like that. They have 30 billion dollars of debt, which is a lot of debt. However, that debt stretches out, you know, stretches out to 50, 80 years out as well. 
So not a single year they have a maturity that exceeds a billion dollars. Therefore, even if the bond market is closed tomorrow, they can pay off whatever maturity comes their way from the cash flows. And uh, so, and I think they yield right now, enterprise yield is close to 8%. And I think, I think they'll be raising the dividend. Um, so, and I, it traded like nine times free cash flows. So like we just talked about Teslas and GameStops and AMCs and Suddenly, we're talking. Like, so now we're talking about you know. And by the way, this is not a mountain ice cube. We will be consuming. By the way, enterprise transports mostly natural gas or natural gas liquids, which we use production of cars, whatever. Um, so, the point I'm trying to make, like that's a domain of sanity. That's a like company you can actually analyze, you can value it. Run the speaking of uh, insiders. Uh, 25 or 26% of the company is owned by founders' family. So I bet they will not be making stupid acquisitions. So anyway, that's, let's just stick to one example for now. So yeah. Definitely. Well, uh, because I'm really looking forward to Q- Q&A. For I'm, sure, uh, for sure. And yeah. we, we do have a, a, a big old list of questions generated here. Um, more and more have been rolling in as we've been going through things. But we do have one coming uh, directly from our side over on Guru Focus uh, from one of our users, Fred. Um, and he was, he was questioning, uh, what is your thought process for deciding to sell a stock whose price is far outpaced underlying intrinsic value? Okay. Well, in that example, you should just sell it. Okay. But let me just let me just give you my more uh, kind of my, my selling framework. So when a company you sell a company for three reasons. Um, number one is when you know when you buy a company, we do a huge amount of work, we make certain assumptions what the future will look like. And then the future comes, and for whatever reasons, either we made an we made a wrong assumptions or things, you know, risk happened, future looks different. Then if that's the case, then we might have uh, overestimated the fair value of the company, we'll sell it. Okay, that's one example. Another example is where, um, let's say we have a full exposure to a certain industry. I'm just, you know, and there's a company, and this, so let's say we have owned a company that's, we think it's a 80 cent dollar. So it's still undervalued. But we found a company that is in the same industry that's a forty cent dollar. So we may send sell one company to buy another. Okay. Now third example, and this is where, this is where, company kind of reaches your fair value, and then you figure out what you're gonna do, and the answer is gonna be different for different type of company. Let's say you have a company that is growing earnings very very slowly. I'm gonna be a lot more less patient with selling, and I may be selling it in thirds. Maybe I'll be selling one third at yeah, 95 cents on a dollar at the, you know, at full value, and maybe it's some above, just it's a range, okay? Now, let's say I have another company that's a fast-growing company, has, a, has high return capital, has a long growth runway, and to make things even more interesting, it has a founder or CEO who owns a good chunk of the company. I'll be a lot more patient with selling that and maybe selling it in smaller chunks. And I'll give it much longer leash to this company because the probability of values is so much wider distributed. So. Gotcha. And then uh, Fred wanted to hit you with the flip side of the coin there as well and ask, are you willing to hold stock in a company uh, if you like the company, but knowing the return might be zero or negative over those first couple of years of ownership. I don't, I rarely know what the return is going to be. Like I really, like, you know, I, um, I, I think like return in general, like we look at when by companies, we look, calc- like can we look at the return we're going to make over four or five years at least. And so, but when we get it and how we get it, we have no idea. So I rarely have an opinion how it's going to come. So uh, I guess that would be my answer to that question. Gotcha. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll up to the top of our list now. A decent amount of scroll here over on YouTube, over in the chat. 
Um, I know I've seen a couple coming in here. Um, looks like Frank Wang is up at the top of our chat right now. Um, you hit on Uber at the beginning, and it seems like there's some decent interest in diving in a little bit deeper there. Frank's asking, are you worried about competition and cash burn in their eats business? Um, and it seems like the business is very labor intensive, which is getting a lot of press. Does that cause any worry for you? Oh God, I should not have talked about it. Uh, all right. Could I, could I deflect the question? Not because I don't want to answer it, because I wrote this 12-page article on this. Did I go answer all these questions? For sure. Because it's just, you know, it's a, and, uh, you know, so if you go, if a uh, friend goes to contrarianedge.com, there is, I'm looking at the website and there is a, like, there is a, just a very, you know, kind of lengthy article uh, on Uber. And uh, I would just, you know, you know, if he just, you know, you know, I would implore him to read that. Just, I, I really don't want to, you know, I would rather not talk about Uber because it would be 30 hour, 30 minute conversation. So for sure. Well, we'll, we'll keep things at that, Frank. Uh, Link will be down in the description there, uh, yeah. getting you over there. Uh, so make yeah. it easy for you to go ahead and find that. Uh, he did chime in with another question right after that, though, uh, asking you uh, any thoughts on defense companies coming in. Anything looking yeah. interesting to you today? Yeah. So the I wrote an article about this too, but I'll discuss it. Uh, so if you think about geopolitical, like so, in the beginning we talked about how we look at the micro picture. And we look at risks, you know, kind of, you know, the, because the risk and try to adjust portfolio. Sometimes you can look at risks and say, I'm just going to be in avoidance mode. Sometimes you say, can I actually take advantage if that happens? So I would look at our geopolitical picture today, and it's probably the worst picture we had in the last 30 years, since the end of the Cold War, since Soviet Union collapsed, since I left Russia, basically. Um, and... The environment today is that China, Chinese economy now is almost on par with the United States. You know, some would argue it's larger, depends how you measure it. Um, and uh, when um, for a long time we thought only once China becomes more capitalistic, it's just going to become just like us. And the opposite happened. The more successful it became, the less like us it became. The more it tried to project its power. And um, and the less we, so we, we are, right now we're incredibly integrated with the Chinese economy, thanks to globalization. But it, this started even before the pandemic, but pandemic actually you know, accelerated this trend. We're trying to deglobal, uh, be going through deglobalization. And I think this is very important because like, like, like we can see this deglobalization if you look at the uh, semiconductor industry, right? The uh, we look at the the fact that most of the semiconductors are now made in Asia, uh, Taiwan or South Korea, and Taiwan is a huge source of semiconductors. So now TSMC, Samsung, Intel, and others are bringing their you know production to Texas or Arizona. So that is deglobalization. So we're trying, we're kind of going through a very slow divorce from China. It's going to be, it's going to take a long time. And it's not a binary divorce. It's not like tomorrow we don't rely on China anymore. It's going to be very difficult to sever those ties. But we also, of like, this is slowly becoming a fact, but it's over the next five or 10 years, it will become almost as a given that data is becoming new oil. The more data you have, the bigger your competitive advantage is as a country, as a company, et cetera. So China has been using data right now to basically uh, turn the country into, uh, there was a movie with Sylvester Stallone, Judge Dredd, I think it was Judge, you know, Judge Dredd, where we basically they could tell everything about you, where you are, because there were cameras everywhere. They monitored everything you do. And that's what China is, kind of becoming a judge dread country kind of thing. And it's, you know, and we want to make sure that they don't, you know, we don't become their subjects like that. Uh, so 
we, the, the technology is going through this split where you're going to have a Chinese technology and you're going to have Western technology. When it's, you know, so like when you think about uh, a very simple example is Huawei, which is a largest, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, Chinese companies. We basically, United States and Europe banned their equipment from our country, from our, from our countries. And therefore, because why we did this, we are afraid that they're going to be spyware and better than their equipment. So, so this is what gets interesting. Okay, so it's easy to see how U.S. and Europe does that. Okay, India will go with us. Russia will probably go with China. Middle East, I don't know. Probably with the United States, not sure. And then you look at other countries and you try to figure out which, you know, are they get so the you're gonna have a technological standards will split, and you're gonna have a American standards or let's say Western standards, and you have a Chinese standards. So while that happening, that we also, as Chinese military is growing and becoming stronger, it's gonna project its power. So our military. And European military will become more and more important. And uh, so we own today American stocks and European uh, defense companies. The interesting part about them, like uh, if you if you look at them, they still trade at reasonable multiples, maybe 13 times earnings. And maybe you know, 12, depends on the company, but between 10 and 13 times earnings. They have good balance sheets. They have... A customer that will be, you know, that despite the customer's finances, still gonna, you know, gonna write a check that won't bounce, okay? And um, they, it's non-cyclicals, and uh, they have very reasonable capital allocation over the years. So, and if the global conflict, you know, if you're gonna see more and more global conflict going forward, then their revenues will only get larger, not smaller. So uh, we also have been kind of adding to, you know, European defense companies because Europe, you know, Europe has been underinvested in defense. And when we exited Afghanistan the way we did, we basically showed to Europe that we may not be necessarily be as dependable ally as we used to be. So, UK's, and this happened before the Afghanistan you know, exit, UK's defense budget last year was up 10%. And I, I expect that uh, budget, you know, uh, defense budgets for other countries, European countries, will be rising you know, as well over the years. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's how defense position explained. Definitely. Definitely some interesting thoughts there as well. Hoping to learn coming in next year, asking... Uh, big idea question. Uh, how do you define quality from a company? That is that that is a great question. So I'll give you a couple. I give you a couple uh, answers. My favorite one comes from Warren Buffett, because it's basically sets your mindset to think what quality means. Would you want to if you bought this company and the stock market was closed? Would you feel comfortable owning it? Would you sleep well at night? Um. Let me give you an example, and I don't want to kind of get into specific of this company, but I, let me throw your company at you, Peloton. If you buy it today and you could not sell it for the next 10 years, would you be comfortable with that? You know, may or may not be. You know, this can, you know, okay. Uh, if you bought a um, defense company, for instance, the answer would be different, right? So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it, and once you look at it this way, it puts you in the shoes of an investor, not speculator, right away. Um, another way to look at it, and we kind of look at it from three perspectives, from kind of three angles. Angle number one: Does this company have a competitive advantage, sustainable competitive advantage? Okay, again, that's kind of the stock market being closed for ten years fits well uh, perfectly into that. Okay, so competitive advantage. Uh, number two, does the company have a good balance sheet? Okay. Uh, you know, and number three, management, where we discussed management. If all those three things come together, then you have a quality company. Again, it's a very high level because 
like uh, a company that's going to has, has significant competitive advantage, most likely going to have higher return on capital. You know, that's kind of goes without saying if you have a company that has a good mold. So, understood. And looking down our list, uh, looks like Severe Aurora coming in. Um, looking towards the portfolio side of things, how do you decide on position sizing within that portfolio? Is there an ideal kind of balance in there? Oh, all right. So, I just actually, it's kind of funny. I just wrote about this. So it's going to be, if you really want to get for a very in-depth response, because I did like two or three page write-up on this, uh, check out, there's going to be a contrarian edge in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks. But basically the size of the position for us will be driven by two factors. And we marry them together when we do this. One is going to be company's quality. Another going to be company's valuation. Think about it. Let me give you two extremes. You have low quality overvalued company, you probably want to own as little as possible, probably none. On the other side, you have a high quality company that's significantly undervalued. You want to you know, have a large exposure in your portfolio to that. So we go through every company in the portfolio and give them a quality ratings for every single company. And then for every single company, we give a we determine fair value. So we actually know how much discount to the fair value there is. And then we measure this too. And that's how we get to uh, that's how we get to position size. For sure. And looking down our list, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of lump a couple questions together here. Uh, two kind of key ones here. Uh, asking a, um, and we've hit on this a little bit. Uh, who are your investing heroes? And then from there, um, you mentioned you read a lot. What do you like to read? Where do you look for all this information that you like to bring in? Oh my God. Investing here should be like such an easy question. I always struggle with that one because I just learn from so many different people. And like, like a lot of my friends are kind of my heroes because I learn so much from them all the time. So I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. So I'll skip that question. However, let's talk about the... Reading, um, I, the older I get, the more diverse my reading became. So it's, I used to read just about investing. Over the years, I tried to, I realized life is too short. And so I kind of tried to expand my reading. Um, and uh, so I read a lot about philosophy. Uh, I read, uh, uh, God, I'm, try, I'm trying to think the book, you know, like the latest book I'm reading is about mindfulness. Uh, I read, uh, like, uh, let me see, uh, let me see. Uh, I, I'm not even like, it's very, it's very, it's very, you know, it's very, it's very interesting. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, in fact, I would argue that probably replaces a lot of my reading now, what I used to do, because what happens is that every day I go for about an hour, an hour and a half walk. And I just listen to podcasts continuously. And there I listen to, uh strategy i listened to sam harris's podcast uh oh my god I, I have to go on my podcast i have to look it up but i have like a probably a dozen of uh, podcasts uh i listened to very wise's uh common sense about podcast just a lot right kind of I, tim ferris i try to expose myself to a lot of different uh not just to invest in i'm sure i've listened to a whole bunch of investment podcasts too but that actually kind of interesting. I, I probably read fewer books last year than I had, you know, than the year before. Uh, but I probably spend more hours learning than I had, you know, be, just because, because of podcasts. I mean, I think podcast is just absolutely, you know, you know very, very important for me. For sure. Listen to podcasts. Definitely. It sounds like that world of information is uh, ever expanding there for you. Yeah, and I, and I you know, another thing is I listen to a lot of interviews on YouTube. So I, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you ask me what are my most important subscriptions I have, I subscribe to Spotify and I subscribe to YouTube. And I, like, why would you, when I subscribe to YouTube, I, I have whatever, 10 bucks a month. When I watch YouTube, I get no commercials. And so I listen to a lot of interviews on YouTube and I love listening to interviews. 
Um, so that's probably another another and very different interviews, you know, uh, or presentations from all you know, different people. Definitely. And continuing down our list, uh, it looks like Travis Wood bringing us back to the portfolio side of things, asking how mm -hmm. often do you revalue an investment uh, within that portfolio? Well, we do it at least quarterly, not revalue, but we get new data and we just kind of update our models. We do, you know, and then uh, when a company starts to approach a fair value, we make sure, want to make sure the fair value numbers are still right. Um, but we kind of continuously, we continuously go through, you know, we, before we single company, we build a financial model and we update this, this models at least once a quarter or as the new information comes out. Definitely. And it looks like uh, Richard Daly, one of our, our usual viewers here, chiming in. Um, he's gonna he's gonna put the uh, the nails to you with this one, uh, saying the market seems to be pretty overvalued. Is there anything left to buy out there? Well, he's, he's the same guy who's asking about McKesson, isn't he? Yes, he's a uh, so um, so we own McKesson, and I wrote a lot of articles about this. In fact, I think next week we're gonna. I, my new article is going to come out on McKesson. Um, and he's, Richard is asking about Cardinal Health as well. So I would argue that McKesson is a much higher, it's a, they're similar businesses on some, you know, on some level, but McKesson is just a better run company. And I'll give you an example. Cardinal Health came out a couple of days ago and said, because of inflation, we're going to take out down our guidance for the year. McKesson CEO did a presentation a couple of days ago after that, a cardinal announcement. He was asked this question: Are you impacted by the same headwinds that uh, Cardinal is impacted? They said, "No, we just raise prices." So I can't explain. You know, they, it's a lot of times I can't explain you why Cardinal is better and Marquesan is better managed than Cardinal. But if you look at the historical returns, you can see it in the numbers. So we still own Marquesan, and I brought a few articles about this. I think we here's the interesting part about it. We bought it five years ago. I think it was a $135, $140 stock or so. And we added more when it got to $150. And then they were swapped. You know, they, you know, they got into opioid crisis. Uh, so today, this crisis is resolved. Earnings went up from $13, $13 $15 of, uh, per share to about $23. This year, they can make about twenty-two, twenty-three dollars of earnings. Uh, in the meantime, they also spun out uh, uh, C Change, uh, no, sorry, Change Healthcare, and that you know that was about that another twenty-five dollars or so per share. So it was a good investment so far, and you know it's almost like a double. However, since then, because the earnings went up so much, I would argue it's actually it's one of the cheaper companies we own today because we're basically paying eleven times earnings for. A, uh, an oligopoly in the business that will continue to grow because they distribute pharmaceuticals uh, probably another 3 to 5% a year. They also have been very good capital allocators. They uh, you know, bought a huge number of shares uh, over the last 10 years. So we, they can probably generate 8 to 9% earnings growth. And so to, you know, if you look four or five years out, to get 28 to $30 of earnings. So if you think about it, if you put a 15, 70 times multiple, remember Coke trades at 30, then you're easily can get a you know four or five years out for $150 stock. You know, and today it's at 250 or something. So sure. again, it's not a recommendation. This is just my thinking about the company. I'm Definitely. not recommending anybody, you know, what I'm recommending people go and do their you know, own research. Definitely. Definitely. And it looks like uh Bill James coming in here with a, an interesting question that I haven't seen come up in one of these asking, how do you handle a retiree's portfolio uh, compared to somebody else who needs cash flow to spend? Well, we put them all in Bitcoin and that's it. No, no, we don't. Um, no, NFTs, we did put it by crypto bets. Um, so we actually have two portfolios. We have a we have a, what, what I call core value portfolio, traditional value portfolio. And about two years ago, we created another portfolio, you know, kind of basically focused on dividends. Okay. But the problem is dividend investing, a lot of times it gets you in trouble. Like, because like what the, the, you know, the way people are attracted to Coke and say, 
it's 2.6 percent, etc. Is you know, that's not what we do. We flip it upside down. We we select a universe of company of high quality companies that pay dividends. Then we want to make sure that those companies are really high qualities, that they can sustain that you know keep paying the dividend, and and then we want to make sure they're undervalued. Only if they pass the first, these two undervalued and quality test, then we actually start paying attention to dividend. Like the, then actually dividend comes in, in, into the equation. And we also do it not just in the United States, we do it globally, because I think, uh, especially European markets, there's still some opportunities left. Oh, yeah, and uh, that's where we, about maybe a third of the portfolio today in, the, in Europe. And the, my expectation for the dividend portfolio, again, I'm just telling you how I'm thinking about it. No promises made to anybody here, um, is that this portfolio should produce lower returns than our core portfolio, just because in the core portfolio, we're asking for two thirds of the return we demand from the, those, you know, the dividend portfolio than from our core value portfolio. Though I say this, and about there's probably now fifty percent overlap between the portfolios. Gotcha, gotcha. So the so in other words, in the, our dividend portfolio. If you're basically saying, I need like the clients are saying, I need income stream, and I can accept the volatility because when you own dividend stocks, you're still going to have volatility. But I hope that these companies will be able to raise prices if you know if you have high inflation. And the valuation won't you know, won't contract because we're already buying at this margin of safety. Okay, but again, it's still they still have to have a long term time horizon for that portfolio. Understood. And it looks like Sam's coming in here right at the end of things. Uh, another interesting question here that we haven't had. Um, asking you if you were to create a we'll call it a self study value investing syllabus. For somebody to go from yes. know nothing to a good investor, what would be your greatest hits for that list? And uh, by all means, feel free to plug some of your own writing here as well. Well, it's kind of funny you say this because we actually have that. I created, uh, I wanted to kind of give back to the community and we created a curriculum of that should help somebody to kind of, you know, to learn about value investing. So if you go to Control and Edge, and uh, and you and I have to look. I have to find it. Uh, but you know, it's it's a. If you search for the word student, let me do it right now, and I'll put it, give it to you. Um, we have this whole student curriculum created just for you. Oh, here it is: value investing curriculum. Uh, and I'll put it. How about this? I'll put it myself right now, if I can, in the chat. Perfect. Right here. So. Sam, it's just it's for you. All righty. Well, there you go, Sam. That should do it for you. And it looks like we are buttoned up right against the end of our time period here, Vitaly. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for coming out, answering all these great questions from our audience. Like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure having you out here. Graham, thank you so much. And guys, thank you so much for watching it or listening, uh, whatever you're doing. And uh you, you guys are doing a great job at Core Focus, so thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And for all of you out there in the audience, if you did miss anything or you wanted to revisit anything we hit on today, there will be a full recap here and on Guru Focus. Please do take a moment before you leave here today. Like the video. We love boosting up those likes, especially for our good friends here. And please take a moment to subscribe if you do want to tune in for future content. Outside of that, that's going to be it for us today. So Vitaly, we're going to wish you the best and everybody out there in the audience. We're wishing you good returns moving into this next year. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who'd enjoy this episode, share it with them. To listen to more episodes, visit investor.fm. Enjoy life and prosper.